Good evening, and I again want to thank you for joining us tonight. It's always a blessing to worship together in the house of the Lord, so it's always a blessing. And for those who have joined us online, I want to thank you as well. And my prayer is that our hearts will be challenged to walk closer to the Lord and to our hearts will be obedient to the things that he has us to do. So before I share what the Lord has put on my heart, let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for another opportunity I have to share your word. And I just pray, Lord, that your will would be accomplished, Lord, and that you see each one, whether they're listening online or here in the service. Lord, you see them, you see their hearts. And so I just pray, Lord, you will draw them unto yourself, that you will open our ears to hear and our hearts to receive what you'd have for us this night. In Jesus' name, amen. How many, I want to start off by asking a question. How many have ever been in a house or a building at night when the power has gone off. Okay, a lot of hands went up there. And you're in total darkness. How does that make you feel? Not so good, <laughs> as we're scrambling around, tripping over things, trying to find a candle to light it up. But someone brings in a candle, and they light it in, your, in that room, and it starts to illuminate. It starts to give light to where, where you are. And sometimes, sometimes, when we're in that situation, we think, Lord, where are you? In this darkness, where are you? I'm going to tell you, the world is in spiritual darkness. That's how it is in their life. They're in spiritual darkness. When someone comes and brings and shares the Lord with them, we have given them a candle of hope candle of hope in their life and it begins to to light up their path and in John chapter 8 verse 12 it says and this is what Jesus does when Jesus spoke again to the people he said I am the light of the world whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life he is the light of the world and he removes darkness and deception by illuminating the uh, right way to God's salvation. In, in Psalms, and I don't have this, but in Psalms 119, 105, it says, thy word is a lamp or light into my path and a, and a, and a or sorry, thy word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. That is what Jesus is and his word is. And it illuminates, spiritually speaking, it illuminates our lives and it guides and directs us. The light of Jesus has been taken into the darkness and it must be taken into the darkness of sin that engulfs the hearts and lives of those who are not following him. We must bring that light into the darkness, spiritually speaking, that they need that light. They, every one of them that don't serve the Lord, they have been blinded by the enemy. They've been blinded by him, and so they don't see what we see. So I ask you, do you realize we reflect the light of life? We reflect him. Just as Jesus came into the world as the light of the world, he commands us to be light as well. Look at Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. As believers, we are dep depicted as the light of the world. That's what we are, the light of the world. And I'm going to tell you, if you think about the moon, I want you to think about the moon for just a minute. It has no light of its own. The moon has no light of its own. It reflects the light of the sun. So we as believers reflect the light of Christ. We reflect that light. The closer we get to him, the more we reflect him. So as the sun goes around the moon, what does the moon do? It picks up that light, and at night, we get that. It shines for us. And so when we're with people that don't know the Lord, we shine for the Lord. We let our lights shine. So 
The light has to be evident to others by our good deeds that we do and in the truth and through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how it gets to, to others. We should always be ready to give an account for the hope that we have. Look at 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, reverend Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Not harshly, but in gentleness and respect. Give an account for the hope that is in you. Let them know the light here is not to be covered up. We're not to, to hold it down, but be made obvious for all to see and benefit from, that they too may leave the darkness and come into the light. That's the whole reason. And I will tell you, in the last couple of weeks, I have been reminded how many people need the Lord. My phone, uh, I have lots of text messages throughout the day, and there are many, many who have needs in their life, and a lot of them do not know the Lord, and they have no hope. And my heart breaks for them, and I try to encourage them, but we need to have the light in us to go through some of these things that they're going through. In Psalms 34, 8, it says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. But I want to concentrate on taste and see that the Lord is good. Which means, the taste and see means, try and experience. Try and experience that the Lord is good. You will never know how good he is until you experience his goodness. So, there are many against the Lord that never really have experienced who he is. They're against him and they'll tell you so, but they've never really experienced who he is. And I wanna read you a, a short story, it's called, Have You Tasted My Jesus? It says, at the University of Chicago Divinity School, each year they have what is called Baptist Day. It is a day when all the Baptists in the area are invited to the school because they want the Baptist dollars to keep coming in. On this day, each one is to bring a sack lunch to, eaten, to be eaten outdoors in a grassy picnic area. Every Baptist day, the school would invite one of the greatest minds to lecture in the Theological Education Center. One year, they invited Dr. Paul Tillich. Dr. Tillich spoke for two and one half hours, proving the resurrection of Jesus was false. He quoted scholar after scholar, book after book. He concluded that since there was no such thing as a historical resurrection, the religious tradition of the church was groundless, emotional mumbo jumbo because it was based on a relationship with a risen Jesus who in fact never rose from the dead in any literal sense. He then asked if there were any questions. After about 30 seconds, an old dark skinned preacher with a head of short cropped curly woolly hair, white hair stood up in the back of the auditorium. Dr. Tillich, I got one question, he said as all eyes turned toward him. He reached into his sack lunch and he pulled out an apple and he began eating it. Dr. Tillich, crunch munch, my question is simple question, crunch crunch. Now, I ain't never read them books you read, crunch munch, and I can't recite the scriptures in the original Greek, crunch munch. I don't know nothing about Niebuhr and Heidegger, crunch munch, and he finished his apple. All I want to know is this. The apple I just ate, was it bitter or sweet? Dr. Tillich paused for a moment and answered in extraordinary scholarly fashion. I can't possibly answer that question, for I haven't tasted your apple. The white-haired preacher dropped the core of his apple into his crumbled bag, looked up at Dr. Tillich and said calmly, neither have you tasted my Jesus. The 1,000 plus in attendance could not contain themselves. The auditory erupted with applause and cheers and Dr. Tillich thanked his audience and promptly left the platform. They have not tasted my Jesus. So many have heard about the things of Jesus, but I would ask them, have you tasted my Jesus? 
Do you know who he really is in your life? I have seen different ways the churches have tried to get people to come to their church, even this week on Facebook. They say how good the preacher is, how big their building is. They talk about the good programs that they have to get us caught up in attracting people to the impressive things about the church. They forget the simple message, taste Jesus. And so I think about the early church. Did they have programs? Did they have big buildings? The early church did not. But what did they share? Taste Jesus. See who he is in your life. The apostles, they knew who he was, and that's what they shared, who Jesus was. So I would ask, have you experienced Jesus in your everyday lives? And you have seen him move only as God can. For I have. I have seen him move in my broken heart when I sat at the graveside of my brother. For a year, one day a week, I sat at that graveside and I wrestled with God. God was very patient and he worked with me and he ministered to my heart. I've seen him move on my broken heart. I've seen the Lord move in my heart when my oldest son was diagnosed with diabetes type 1. My heart was calling out to the Lord and the Lord spoke to me. I love him more than you do. Trust me. And I said, okay, Lord. And I will tell you that we, we collect coins when we see them on the ground because the coin says, in God we trust. And so when I see that coin, I'll pick up that coin and I'll say, in, in, in God I trust. And I'm, all my whole family does not we have a little jar that people, that they put their coins in. And November of, of last year, my husband and I went to a swap meet and I, was just praying in my heart to the Lord. There was some things going on in, in my heart and in my life, and I was praying to the Lord. And I was telling him all about it. So then we got out of the truck, we got the swap meet, and we got out of the truck, and I, I walked a few feet. And there by the truck were 64 pennies. I trust you, Lord. I reached down, and I grabbed those pennies, and I put them in my pocket. And there were quite a few in a, in a bundle, and then a few were scattered. And the Lord just spoke to me as I was picking those up. I have heard your prayer. Trust me. Trust me. Have I seen them answered yet? No, I have not. But I am trusting him. I have seen God move in my heart. I have seen God move when I have had cancer and given a short time to live. And they gave me the report on my, in, in my hand, and I looked at it. And I remembered Hezekiah went to the, the, the temple with the letter that he got, and he brought it before the Lord. So I did the same. I brought the letter, and I laid it here on the altar, all by myself, me and God. And I told God, God, they don't give me much time. They don't give me much hope. In fact, you have stage one, two, three, or four on your stage. Mine said final. They did not expect me to live. So I laid it before the Lord, and I said, Lord, this is what they say, but you have the final say. And God heard my prayer, and he ministered to my heart. I have seen him do that. I have seen him provide financially in our lives. I have tasted and I have seen the faithfulness in my life and so many others. I have seen God's faithfulness. I have tasted of Jesus. Queen Elizabeth II only endorsed one biography about her life with a personal foreword. The book is called The Servant Queen and the King She Serves. It was released in celebration of her 90th birthday. The book recounts of her faith guided her as she served her country. In the foreword, Queen Elizabeth expressed gratitude for everyone who's prayed for her, and she thanked God for his steadfast love. She concluded, quote, I have indeed seen his faithfulness, unquote. She had tasted Jesus. She relied on Jesus to run her country. Her simple statement echoes the testimonies of men and women throughout history who have experienced the personal, faithful care of God in their lives. Back in the 1800s, a skeptic promised a famous British preacher, his name was Alexander Mac Mac 
Warren. He was born in 1826 and he died in 1910. And this skeptic promised that he would attend his church for four Sundays. And Warren told the skeptic that during those sermons, he present reasons why he should believe in Jesus. The skeptic was true to his word and he showed up each Sunday, listening intently to the sermons. And after the fourth message, he stepped forward to become a Christian. And McLaurin was delighted, but he couldn't resist the impulse to ask which of the sermons brought about the decision. The skeptic replied, your sermons, sir, were helpful, but they were not what finally persuaded me. He said that after church one Sunday, as he was helping an elderly lady on a slippery walk, she looked up into his face and said, I wonder if you know my Savior, Jesus Christ. He's everything in the world to me. I would like you to know him too. For that woman, there was only one theological question to ask. Have you tasted my Jesus? She asked him, do you know him? And I can say that my grandmother, before she passed away, and there were nurses that came into her bedroom, hospice nurses, and Grandma, every time, would ask them, do you go to church? Do you know Jesus? And she shared Jesus with them. There were many that know about Jesus because of my grandmother. Theological question, have you tasted my Jesus? Have you tasted him? God, God's designed our Christ-centered, um, he's, he's filled our faith with Christ-centered. He wants us to be Christ-centered, spirit-led, and word-fed. But somehow, many have gotten off track and allowed the echoes of fears and, and uh, faults to silence God's voice. Take a look around you. We can't say this and we can't say that because we will offend someone and therefore we're quiet and we don't share God's voice. We dwell on our failures and let them determine our direction. We worry on our frailties, disqualifying us from doing God's work for God. God has good works and words for us. First Thessalonians 5.24 says, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. If he's called you, he's faithful, he will do it. He will move in us to accomplish the work he has planned for us. God sees our potential even when we can't, and he considers us worthwhile just the way we are. Will he leave us there? No. He will work on us until we could become more and more like him, but he sees we are worthwhile where we are. It is easy for us Christians to get caught up doing our daily schedules. Wake up, go to work, school, errands, housework, house cleaning, whatever. We eat dinner at the end of the day, and maybe watch some television and, pre and prepare to do it all over again the next day. And in that environment, we can often forget to worship Christ regularly. But to worship it's in itself refreshes our soul. It refreshes us. Before you step out the door each morning, sit down and take a moment to thank God for a new day. Because I will tell you that I've had several call me and say that so-and-so is not here today. They were yesterday, but they're not here today. So we thank God for each day that he gives us breath to do what he's asking us to do. If your, your work is a nice area, sp spend your lunch hour walking around and praising God. I see a lot of people walk in their lunch hour, and I'm thinking, I hope they're praising God while they're out there walking. In the evening, make space where God can be, you can be alone with God. There are different times during the day or of the evening. We can connect with God. We are called to love God, so let us make time for him. Start tonight experiencing God's goodness and blessing as you seek to serve him daily. For those who have not yet really tasted of my Jesus, I invite you to, to give him a try. Open up your heart to him. Invite him to come in. Ask for forgiveness 
for your sins. Ask him to be the Lord of your life. Then I would say, find a good Bible-believing church. Attend the services. Read your Bible. And let God use you. He will take you from darkness to light. That's what he will do. And, and for those who are listening online, if you have questions about Jesus, to know him, call the office. I would be glad to talk with you about Jesus. And for those who don't know the office number, it's 619-423-0661. Do you know my Jesus? Have you seen him work in your life? And a lot of you have. You've seen his faithfulness in your, your life. And so I would say keep believing. Keep shining your light so others can know him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this opportunity I've had to share your word. And Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, you are faithful to us. Yes, we do go through things. And some of us can, some of the things we go through can knock us off our, our guard. But nothing catches you by surprise. You're very much aware of each one of our lives and what we go through. But you are saying to trust you, to walk with you, to let you guide us, direct us. And in doing so, we are also to share you with others. So I pray, Lord, that you will minister to our hearts this night as we say, yes, Lord, and really get to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand and we'll be dismissed. <clears throat>